So, here's things from the other side of the fence. Keeping in mind that, like I said before, the runner starts off with five cards in the hand at the beginning of the game, and five bits. They can draw a card, or they can gain another bit for one action. They have four actions during their turn, and they're not forced to draw a card at the beginning of their turn, unlike the corporation. Now, this ice is broken using ice breakers. Yep, that was seamless. Like this one. So, this jackhammer costs one to install, and it is an icebreaker. It's very, it's a lot simpler in fact, the playing of cards on the runner side than it is on the corporation, because almost all of the information is, is open. So if we had this in our hand as the runner, for one action, we could pay one bit in order to install this program, the jackhammer. So, let's do that. Pay a bit, and it's on the table. Now remember that we can make a run on anything that's exposed. That includes the deck, R&D, the hand, HQ, and the archives. Um, so for the other three actions, the runner could just go bang, 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 and look at three random cards from the um, corporation's hand, bang and have a look at the top card of the deck. It wouldn't be worth doing that three times because they just look at the top card of the deck every time and bang into the archives. Keeping in mind that if there are any face down cards or any cards from the corporation's hand that have to get discarded, they aren't automatically exposed by going into the archives. They're actually discarded face down, so you're not necessarily going to know whether there's been any agendas turn up in there or not. But let's say that we um, decide that obviously this must be something of importance and that the run needs to be made on this server with the ice that's protecting it. So, we encounter the first piece of ice. It is no longer blurry. It is the ice sentry, which has a subroutine of uh, adding plus two strength to the other ice that's encountered. Now, we know that we don't have an icebreaker that can break sentry subroutines. This one clearly says that it can only break a wall subroutine. You can see that there. So we don't break that subroutine, but the run continues because that subroutine didn't say that the run ends. We get to this point, and we have a choice of either jacking out and escaping from the run, or we encounter this piece of ice and try and deal with it. So let's have a look at what we're trying to deal with. Data wall, which ends the run, has a strength of zero, but because of the sentry, it actually has a strength of two. So if we want to try and get through this um, ice, we need to be able to break this wall subroutine with the strength of two. Let's have a look at, look at what our jackhammer does. It's got two abilities that you have to pay bits in order to achieve. You might not be able to read that. The first one costs zero and allows you to break a wall subroutine. The second one costs one bit and adds plus one strength to the jackhammer. Now in the bottom right corner you can see that the jackhammer actually has an initial strength of zero. We're going to need to boost up this jackhammer's strength to a strength of two if we're going to be able to break the subroutine uh, on that data wall. So we'd have to pay two bits, one for every plus one of strength we want to achieve, and then in this case pay an additional zero bits to use this jackhammer to break that wall subroutine. If this ice had multiple subroutines on it, we'd have to break each one separately, but the strength um, lasts the whole time that you're trying to break that piece of ice. Although if you had two pieces of ice in a row, you'd have to boost up the strength twice in order to, um, to use the same uh, icebreaker on those two pieces of ice. So we t pay our two bits in order to boost up the strength of the jackhammer, and lo and behold, the second piece of ice's subroutine has been broken, and we are no longer impeded for accessing the agenda. We've got through these pieces of ice, and we get to have a look at whatever this card is, and of course, you guys know that it's an agenda. And the runner has scored two points towards the seven they need for victory. So because there are three different types of ice, there are also three different types, or general types, of our icebreakers. Ones that break wall subroutines, ones that break cogate subroutines, and ones that break sentry subroutines. You're gonna need, in quite a few games, all three types at varying stages in order to try and get through the different sorts of defenses that the corporation is going to put up against you.
Now, one of the interesting things is, is that each of these um, programs, these icebreakers, have a certain number of memory units that they take up in your massive awesome computer that you must be running as the runner. In this case, one memory unit. It says next to icebreaker there. You have four memory units at the start of the game and there are certain cards that you can install that allow you to increase your memory units. Such as this one. The WooTech Mem Chip. Um, so this costs one and will cost an action to uh, install. It's a hardware chip and it provides plus one memory unit. So you potentially be able to have five of these sorts of icebreakers or maybe on top of these three you'd be able to install one more that took up two memory units. Now um, aside from uh, the programs you really don't have many restrictions on what you can play. Hardware you can play as many as you want of and they're typically played sort of maybe behind the, um, the programs because the programs are more important to um, making runs and more important to the corporation. So you can install as much hardware as you want across the back. There's also a third type um, called resources. Resources are played in the same way as uh, the other cards. You'd pay, in this case, two bits in order to uh, play this um, for an action. And this dude, the Leyland Corporate Bodyguard, um, allows you to do two different things. The first one is you can pay one bit to prevent one meat damage and the second one is you can trash it to avoid receiving a tag. So here's two concepts that are uh, not known yet. So I've only really shown you the really basic forms of uh, ice so far, but the corporation has access to some real bastards like this one. Ta-da! Cortical Scrub. One of the subroutines on this, if it happens to run, says do one brain damage. And even if you break that, it's still going to end the run with a second subroutine. Keeping in mind, if let's say we did encounter this piece of ice, you could choose to take the brain damage and just... Uh, end the second subroutine ending the run and you still be able to progress your run to the next stage. So what does this brain damage mean? Well there are three different types of damage. Net damage, meat damage and brain damage. Meat damage and net damage are pretty much only different from a flavour perspective and in the way that you can try and prevent it with different cards. They both cause you to discard a card from your hand. Brain damage is much more of a bastard. What happens is with brain damage you still have to discard a card but also your maximum hand size reduces by one. It starts off at five so one brain damage will reduce your maximum hand size to four. So after a couple of those it can make things really difficult pretty quickly. Now if you are ever as the runner in a position where you have to discard a card and you can't then that's it. You have effectively flatlined. You are dead and it is game over for you, regardless of how many agenda points you've scored compared to your opponent. So damage is really important to look out for and to try and avoid. It isn't always possible though, and one of the reasons is because of tags. So tagging from a flavour perspective is basically the corporation getting some information on the runner, which makes the runner vulnerable to different sorts of attacks. Here's a um, one certain way that a uh, corporation might be able to achieve this and this is through uh, the action that's uh, enabled after this particular agenda is scored. Magic! Um, so this says uh, use an action and that little return key is an action in, uh, in the old version of uh, Netrunner that I'm playing with. Use an action and do a trace up to two. There's a little two there. If the trace is successful give the runner a tag. This is going to require me to explain uh, traces, so let me just finish off talking about tags. You, if the runner receives a tag, then you mark that with a marker somehow. The runner can have multiple tags, and uh, having a tag can be uh, detrimental, and the runner really wants to get rid of them. So the runner can actually, on their turn, spend two bits to get rid of one of the tags that they have. If they're not able to do that before the um, corporation can start acting on it, then various dodgy things can happen, such as uh, this card that the corporation can play called Closed Accounts, which is play only if runner is tagged. Runner loses all bits, so no more money for the runner. Or this terrible one, Scorched Earth, an operation play only if the runner is tagged, do four meat damage. So if you've got three cards in your hand, when this card is played, your game is over. So that's pretty scary. So you really want to try and get rid of tags as quickly as you can. And regardless of what cards the corporation has in their hand, they can spend two bits and an action on their turn to trash 
one of your resources. So is this dude, for example, gone because he's a resource. Now, of course, you wouldn't do that because the whole reason for having a bodyguard is to avoid receiving a tag. So you'd use the ability on this card, which is trash, to avoid receiving a tag and you wouldn't get it. Right, so I think that's all that I need to explain about tags. There's pretty much only one complicated thing left to explain, and that's traces. Let's get this trace card back. <clears throat> Quite often traces will come from ice, but they can also, as you see, come from um, asset ability, sorry, agenda abilities. Um, also, they can come from uh, other cards that the uh, corporation plays. So, this says trace 2. When you initiate a trace, whether it be during a run or during an action on your turn, the corporation secretly chooses a number of bits to pay from their side, and the runner also secretly chooses a number of bits. But the runner also has to choose um, something else. I think this is going to be different in the uh, the new version of Netrunner, so I'm just going to pass over this um, quickly. Um, uh, runners have the uh, these cards called resource base links, and that allows them to establish a certain amount of running awayness from the trace that the um, <coughs> corporation is trying to achieve. This one, for example, you use one bit to establish a base link of one, and then for every additional one bit you pay, you get an additional one link. So when a trace is initiated, corporation chooses a number of bits up to the trace number on the card, keeping in mind that the trace number that we had on here is 2, which isn't very strong. So the corporation would choose 0, 1 or 2 bits secretly. The runner would choose which base link card they're going to use, tell that to the corporation, and then hide in their hand, or however else you want to secretly choose, a number of bits, and then those two things are revealed together. Let's say the corporation revealed um, two bits in their hand, like this, then that would mean that the runner would have to establish a base link of at least, I think, three to run away. I'm pretty sure that if the um, corporation equals the base link, then the corporation is, is successful in establishing um, the trace. So, in this case, unless you've paid one bit to increase your uh, base link by one, and one bit to establish that base link of one, and then an additional bit to make it three, unless you've paid three bits, then that trace is going to be successful on you. I think in the new version, um, you don't have base links, you just have different cards that allow you to establish a, um, a base number that don't require paying a number of bits under normal circumstances, and also, it's not both players doing a blind bid and revealing at the same time. The corporation decides how much they um, want to put out, and then the runner decides whether or not they're going to uh, match that in order to avoid receiving the tag or avoid the trace being successful and having other things happen to them. Both sides also have uh, one-off effect cards, cards that are discarded um, as soon as they're played and have a particular one-off action. For the runner, these cards are called preps, so you'd spend one action, pay four bits in this case, this would happen straight away and the card goes straight to the trash. On the corporation side of things, they are called operations. This one, Trojan Horse, costs two, and in this case it says play only if the runner stole any agendas during his or her last turn, give runner a tag. Sucks to be the runner. There's only one type of card left which I think I haven't explained. The other one I haven't explained is upgrades. You play these in the same row as when you have your existing servers, and it provides a particular effect to um, that server. In this case, all nodes and other upgrades installed inside the fort cost an additional two bits to trash in addition to the normal cost. So this could be cool um, on this particular server, uh, especially if you happen to be um, hiding a node there that you don't want to be trashed. Uh, this isn't going to help you protect uh, an agenda though. All different sorts of upgrades are available and they uh, can be quite useful. So I think that's it. I'm running out of battery power.